you become interested in Jerry County? Well, it's kind of an interesting story because um, I uh, went back to graduate school to get my master's in social work and I wasn't interested at all in aging, um, as many people, <laughs> especially in social work, aren't. Um, I do remember being impressed at the opening um, orientation for our class <clears throat> with um, a guy named Purcell Stanford who uh, was very active on the national level and he was the head of the aging um, <clears throat> uh, component in, in our school of social work. But I actually was into women's health at the time and um, I think it's kind of flattery will get you everywhere. I had a professor who was a policy, really interested in policy, and he knew I was very interested in policy, and he said, I really think that you ought to move over to the aging um, uh, specialization because of your interest in policy. So that's kind of how I started uh, out in uh, getting into aging, which I really enjoy, and I do have a uh, concentration in aging in my, in my degree. So that was kind of the start of it, and um, <clears throat> I think from there I just um, really enjoyed it. I worked, um, after graduating, I uh, stayed with Purcell Stanford at the um, Center on Aging and um, worked a lot with minority aging, um, grant development and whatnot, and just, I don't know, I, I just, it, I kind of fell into it. I'm not one of these people, you always hear these stories of, oh, I lived with my grandparents or something like that. That wasn't the case. I really had no intention. And I think I had all the biases that you know many people have in terms of, oh, gosh, I don't want to work in a nursing home. But um, <clears throat> you know, it's one of those things, once you get exposed, mm -hmm. um, it's really uh, far more interesting um, than one would think. My husband is also in the field of aging, so I think that kind of helps. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> um, he's a, a researcher. Um, I am not a researcher. Um, I'm, again, more into policy, and I've <clears throat> the deputy, been the deputy director at the Gerontological Society for a long time. So I think his interest in demography and kind of the issues that he was interested in um, I think just kind of strengthened uh, my interest in, in gerontology. Describe your career tra trajectory as a gerontologist. <coughs> um, I always think my career tra 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 trajectory is um, um, kind of serendipitous in a way. So that I c kind of got into gerontology kind of by serendipity in some ways. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> I was working at uh, the Center on Aging, as I mentioned, uh, at San Diego State, and um, here's where a woman who, I don't even know her name, but she was a keynote speaker at something that I was in charge of organizing. It was a um, minority aging conference <clears throat> that we did annually, and this woman was just a remarkable speaker. She was our keynote speaker. She was uh, used puppets and she had used puppets with kids around disability mm -hmm. and then had gotten into uh, aging. I was so mesmerized by this woman and I sat down afterwards and was chatting with her <clears throat> and I don't know even how this came up but I just said, oh, I've always dreamed of being in uh, Washington, D.C. And she said to me, she said, I'm gonna give you one piece of advice. She says, do not get to the end of your life and say what if. And I have to say, it made such a strong impression on me that in literally three months, I was living and uh, working in Washington. Um, I <clears throat> went um, for a week. I knew two people, and that was all, another social worker who had uh, gotten a job at AERP. And um, I went for a week. I just had set up interviews. I actually went to a ASA before and uh, met a lot of people in Washington and then uh, followed up and met with them when I was in uh, DC. And um, people were just really, really nice. Um, just 
you know, informational interviews, and I talked to a lot of people. And I just happened to this one guy that I met, uh, Eric Julien. Um, he said, oh my gosh, a friend of mine is leaving her position at the Gerontological Society, and um, I think your background would be perfect. Uh, they had kind of closed the position, and so I, when I called, uh, the woman said, absolutely, we'd love to interview you. We're interviewing, like, tomorrow. So I walked out, uh, away after a week, having a job, having to turn around in a week or two to move myself back to Washington. So that's how I got there. Mm -hmm. um, I never, ever thought I would stay as long as I did. I've been at GSA and in Washington for 35 years. I, um, I think w uh, the Gerontological Society was really good for me in the sense that I, I felt like I needed a place where I could be um, creative and kind of have space uh, to do things that I wanted to do. And I've really had that opportunity at GSA. I've done a lot of different things, and I've done, um, you know, a couple things I'm just really proud of. Uh, one being a lot in the area of minority aging, which I did uh, in San Diego uh, with Purcell, and continued to do that, and um, helped um, launch the first um, task force uh, in minority aging uh, for GSA. And you know, one of the I know one of the things is that mentors and people who, and one of the people that I think of that was just one of the most lovely people and um, just a great mentor in my life was Thea Jackson. And Thea um, worked, I think she was deputy director at the um, New York State Department um, on Aging, and she was just a phenomenal person. And I feel like I learned so much from her and she was the, you know, the person that really got the task force going. So that was kind of my, one of my first mentors in, uh, in Washington. Um, and then I've, I've actually just, I've been at GSA all those years. Um, so that is kind of my trajectory, um, other than just the different things that I've, I've done at, uh, at GSA. Aside from the minority aging, uh, well, one of the more recent ones uh, that I'm really, really proud of is I worked with uh, Paul Clayman um, to establish a Journalists in Aging fellows progr Fellowship Program, fellows program um, at GSA, and we had uh, some support from MetLife. Um, it has been really successful. MetLife pulled out of aging altogether, and so we got we were able to get funding from AARP, and now we have Silver Century Foundation. But we had last year we had, I think it was around 19 um, uh, journalists that we bring to our annual meeting, mm -hmm. um, and then we had we bring uh, former fellows back. So we must have had close to 30 journalists that we had at our meeting, and it's an opportunity to orient them to issues around aging. Mm -hmm. uh, they're required to do some art, uh, articles or pieces off of the annual meeting, but then they, to get become a fellow, they had to propose a more long-range um, um, article, or some of them do um, film. So that one um, I'm very proud of, and continuing and um, um, we, we've just done really well with, with that one. Um, I think the other thing, of course, is um, Hartford, <coughs> the Hartford Foundation, the John A. Hartford Foundation. Um, because my background is social work, they were um, looking for a home for <coughs> their um, faculty scholars program uh, in uh, geriatric social work. And um, so it came to GSA, and we had that for, um, about 16 years, mm -hmm. and um, I, I'm really proud of that because I think it kind of brought me back to, uh, you know, my social work roots, and uh, it's just so needed because so many social workers um, are working with older people, you know, almost you know, probably 95 percent uh, have some contact with uh, an older family member, and very, very few of them have any kind of training. So um, that was really good, and that kind of brings up 
another very close friend and mentor, I would say, and that's Barbara Berkman. Um, Barbara has, um, we are total opposites in many ways. I mean, it's really been fun. She is like um, just a super organized, you know, like uh, way ahead of the game. And um, um, I'm kind of more laid back. She likes to be you know, like, uh, at the front of the uh, room and talking and uh, I'm happy just to be um, there supporting and helping. Um, but she has just been um, really, um, just on a personal level as well as a professional level, I, I've just learned so much. We just remain really, really close friends. You know, I, uh, it's an interesting question because I'm not sure I would call myself a gerontologist. When I hear the word gerontologist, I think of somebody who does research. Mm -hmm. um, that's what it means to me. Um, I, so I, I don't call myself a gerontologist. I don't know what I call myself. I don't call myself a social worker either mm -hmm. because I don't do what I consider typical social work. Mm -hmm. um, I have expertise in gerontology, but I, I, I just, I don't describe myself as a gerontologist. My husband, on the other hand, who is a researcher, I would see him more as a gerontologist. So you're already talking about your mentors, but do you have any other um, female mentors that have impacted you that you think? Hmm. I just, uh, you know, I, having been at the Gerontological Society, there have just been <clears throat> so many um, people that, um, you know, you learn from. And um, I, I think about, you know, I think in, in my uh, Hartford uh, involvement with uh, the grants, um, there have just been so many people that I have um, seen that are just, I think what uh, strikes me most about uh, many of the women that I've been involved with through the Hartford, these are people that are in their senior, you know, more senior um, part of their career, and they're all so giving. Um, I, I'm just impressed in terms of how much they want to give back. Um, and one of the, uh, I mean, I, Rosalie Kane, uh, um, is you know one of those who uh, I've known for um, probably close to 35 years, but I just see what you know she gives back and, and wants to make sure that the next generation um, you know gets support from her, and so it's really been you know a, a role model in a sense uh, all the people because part of the um, Hartford program involves. Uh, mentors. We we have uh, all of our faculty scholars had uh, a mentor that was that worked with them for two years. So these were very senior people, uh, Susan Hughes, you know Rosalie, um, that were just remarkable. Mm -hmm. What is unique about being a woman in gerontology? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, you know, it's um, it's interesting because actually women, uh, I, at least at the gerontol, I, I don't think it, it's probably uh, true in a lot of places, but uh, in the gerontological society, women are dominant within uh, the field. Um, so to me, it's kind of like social work. Uh, you get a lot of different types of people and everything else, but women, um, and I think the average age in GSA, it's probably gone up actually, is about 47. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think it's a, a field that has attracted um, women. I, th you know, it took, um, actually in our leadership I think has really changed. I think back to Ollie Randall was the first woman uh, to be a president of GSA. Um, um, and then you know, it really was a field in the beginning, interestingly enough, dominated by men. Mm -hmm. 
there were v very few. I think, as a matter of fact, I think Ollie Randall was uh, the only female member for quite a long time. And so it's really uh, changed um, over, over the course of the years, and certainly um, I would say it's probably increased since I've been at GSA. With your own personal agent. Well, that, yeah. Um, well, interestingly enough, I have just this year um, stepped down as deputy director, and um, I've gone to uh, a three day a week schedule. Mm -hmm. um, and that is influenced by knowing, you know, uh, that you don't go cold turkey. Mm -hmm. And because I've worked my whole life, um, we've raised three kids. I've never had any free time, so I know from research that mm -hmm. um, I really d should not go cold turkey. So that was that was a learning experience. I think when we dealt with um, caregiving issues, we, uh, particularly with my mother-in-law, um, I think because my husband and I were both uh, in the field, that it was helpful. But I think it was also eye-opening in the some of the issues that in theory um, look one way. Uh, in reality, it's not as easy. I think home care, you know, a lot of the issues that uh, in a textbook look, you know, like here's what you would do. Well, sometimes the services aren't there. You know, it's a lot more complicated, um, I think, in reality. Um, and and uh, with my mother, um, I also had the experience of going through hospice. It was actually a very short period of time, but again, I think it was it was really eye opening to me because it, again, it was a word that I heard, and you know, it was discussed in a lot of different ways. But um, when you actually experience it, I was so impressed. I mean, I was really impressed because. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you think you know about things when it's your own parent. Um, they were so helpful in terms of describing every step of what was going to happen. And uh, it, was, it was, yeah, in the hospice. It was, uh, it was really remarkable. You know, I think um, the other thing is that, you know, you learn that um, aging is, you want to stay healthy and, um, so that's always been kind of a major um, thing that I've done. I was an um, athlete when I was younger. I was a swimmer, competitive swimmer, but I've made sure that I continue um, to do things that are healthy. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is that I'm actually uh, a participant in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study. So that's been interesting um, because, again, you know, you. Uh, now I go every two years, so um, you get this full, you know, workup, and you're, you know, you're very aware of how 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 well or not well you're aging, um, and it's it was really interesting to me to be on the other side of research, you know, to be a participant and to see what you know kinds of things our members uh, are doing. I enjoyed that. Well, um, I, I started out, uh, because it's very hard to get into anymore, um, I started out in a perimenopausal study, which um, um, I had to go every three months. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they do blood work. It was just a, a short, like a day. Mm -hmm. um, they, I, they took me out of it because I showed some signs of um, bone loss. Not, not that it was serious, but they suggested I get off and take hormone replacement. So then I got into the regular, they just moved me into the regular thing. I now go three days mm -hmm. and have all different kinds of testing and sometimes they'll do extra tests. Mm -hmm. um, like uh, they, they did one on uh, uh, your, the saliva in your mouth and how it changes uh, with, with age. Um, I've done, um, I did one that was uh, particularly weird uh, sensation uh, it was uh, about uh, they pump you with adrenaline you're in a MRI machine they pump you with adrenaline so your heart it just feels like it's going to burst out of your chest and then they'll stop it and they watch the recovery of your heart um, 
So that was kind of an interesting one. They do a lot around gait. And, you know, it's one thing because I'm, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, 65, but I'm still young in their, in their group. So, you know, you, you don't think much about gait, but what they really do is they watch over time how it changes. And it's fascinating. You have these little um, sticky balls that are on you and it's all done um, by computer and they watch you know your gait and they watch watch it over time and that's the key of the research it's not like how you are that day but they're watching how you track over time um, I have one more question has that influenced um, from the results in the testing has that influenced any uh, different way that you've lived your life or I think it just makes you more conscious of um, yeah mm -hmm. um, I, I think I'm pretty healthy but it mm -hmm. you know you do look at the numbers when they yeah. come in and well it, that's a good point because actually my thyroid was a little uh, high mm -hmm. and they told me that I should watch mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. so um, because they do so much more testing than just going to your doctor's yeah. office mm -hmm it's really the benefit um, because it does take a lot, you know, it takes three days of your time to, to do it. It gives you a lot more information. Oh my gosh. Oh, absolutely, because they do so many tests. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, the Wiggle Project focuses on the legacies of older women during college. Within that framework, is there anything else you would like Um, I, I think it's a, first of all, I just think it's a wonderful project, as I mentioned. Um, I think to capture, you know, the women today mm -hmm. and in the future. And it'll be interesting, you know, over time to see the differences of, and the different experiences, how people, how women uh, got into the field. Um, I'd be curious to know at the end of all of this mm -hmm. if it was uh, purposeful or more like me, serendipitous. Um, uh, I, 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 most of the, when I was uh, in the School of Social Work, um, I think one of the things that actually drew a lot of people into the field was they had um, training money from the Administration on Aging, which they don't have anymore. And I think it made a huge impact in terms of bringing people into the field. Um, people that might not have already gone. Now, I didn't get any of that money. I got in another way, but it was a way to, mm -hmm. to draw people. And I think it's a shame that we don't, you know, have those kinds of resources uh, to bring more people in. And um, I, you know, I, I, we really need people. I, I think even just, you think about social work, uh, the, um, all of the um, aging services, um, you know, the studies that have been done about how, how little um, uh, knowledge the people that are working in the field have about older people is frightening. And it's, it's only going to get worse as the population increases and there's no one that really um, knows enough about uh, working with older people. As a matter of fact, I did a, um, this was a really interesting thing. I, was um, asked to be on a panel for uh, NASW. It was a press briefing on um, the workforce and the um, <clears throat> geriatric social workforce. And um, I had been trained uh, in communications to make that the stories are much more powerful than numbers. So I had one of my staff who is a, uh, has been a clinical social worker. I said, you know, I need you know, some stories, and, and I, it was really, I mean, I didn't even know this, um, but she, she, was, she gave me an example of how it can make a difference with um, uh, persons with Alzheimer's. So a, she gave me a case that um, a, a woman came in and said, my mother's not eating, and I can't get her to eat, and, and everything, and a trained social worker who knows about these issues knows that you put one thing on the plate with, so there's no decision making. Um, and 
and the other thing was, you know, like uh, people with Alzheimer's having water go over their head, this woman wouldn't take a shower. So there's a difference between uh, somebody who, who knows and can zero right in on the solution versus um, somebody who says, well, I don't know why she's not eating. Have you tried different foods or, you know? Um, and as a matter of fact, when I used that example, uh, it was interesting to me how many uh, the, peop uh, the uh, journalists in the audience came up to me afterwards and said, I really was interested in your story. And I said, well, talk to my staff person because she's the expert. But, um, and I, that's why I say, I, you know, I have training in, in gerontology, but I'm not uh, a geriatric social worker. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, here was a woman that um, really had the expertise.